that's one of my favorite things. Well, I feel like it was like a, it was kind of a jumping point. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to keep it like classic action figure, but I wanted to add more like right. angst and more power to it or whatever. So good way to bring it up. Well, we must lose sight. We're going to bring everybody in. Hey, everybody. This is Don Lanning. Uh, happy Easter. Uh, we're here at my D3 studio, and uh, we wanted to do something special today. Um, for those of you that know me, you know I love to reimagine um, uh, icons of our culture and pop culture. I've done my own version of Wizard of Oz and stuff, and I had a really amazing experience this week with a wonderful artist that's an experienced working artist, and uh, he's reimagined something that's in our pop culture, and I just had so much fun, I wanted to do an artist spotlight. Uh, I want to introduce you to Kevin Lewis. Kevin, welcome to the shop. Thank you for having me, Don. It's yeah. been an incredible week. Um, right on, right on. Taken what I, what I had hoped to get out of this class to right. like a whole new level. So it's been well, absolutely amazing, and I appreciate all that. Well, I'm going to give you your information, but I want to tell you that um, often in the class we have folks that come that are brand new to sculpting. Sometimes we have folks that are digital artists and want to up their game. Uh, Kevin is an amazing, amazing artist, uh, a tattoo artist. Uh, and uh, well, I want to pause for a second. I'm going to have Gabby come over and look at this board that we put up. And there's Kevin's information. If you want to contact him for whether it be sculptures, which is a new aspect yeah. of his life opening up, you never know, <laughs> or, uh, or tattoos and, uh, and all the work thereof. Look, there's a little friend. Will you tell us about that sculpture right there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a little, uh, little fun I was having. That's a little Frankenstein sculpture of my dog. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was my first hand at trying like little tiny things to try to mold things or sculpt things, and I made it out of epoxy sculpt. But that I like the idea. I like the idea of that because it was like quick setting, and you kind of sort of like tattooing. You have to like yeah, yeah. set it and forget it. You have to commit, you right. know. So that was kind of fun to to do that to right. that sort of thing. So. Well, I love that you're a person like all of us in the business. Yeah, that's my the, boy. The decorative <laughs> arts. You have something you love, and you want to bring it into three dimensions. I love this because I was wondering what he had sculpted before and he brought this, look at the tooth. He brought this to the class and I love it. It's so inspired and of course you love monsters like yes, I do. Absolutely. But let me put that's this the, back. That's the both worlds. That's right. That's right. Well, you know we had uh, this wonderful thing. I just want to jump right into it. I'm going to start with this. Uh, well, because he has experience, he was able to do a drawing. Now as I've said before, uh, when we visited, uh, when we have students come in and sculpt something for the first time or come in with a concept, do you have to know how to draw? No. But in his case, it's an absolute wonderful kickoff point. Plus, he already has lots of experience uh, realizing all kinds of con uh, concepts to then put on people's bodies. Amazing, wonderful. So he is sure-footed artist. And he was able to come in, and in the first day, he brought this sketch on. And you can see... <laughs> that certainly this was a great jump off point as many of these illustrations and drawing are for us once he got into the clay if you agree yeah definitely uh, there's so much more that he can do beyond the drawing when i receive a design drawing working on a film it's more to give me confidence it's more to show me where i'd like to go and where the client wants to go but then in the three dimensions things open up and of course you're able to move in a linear way and move around the subject I can't wait to move this around. Actually, we're going to stop for a moment. I want you to hold that. And I'm going to turn this a little bit. We're going to come back and show your references in a second. I want you to talk about this character. Start with its name. Uh, his trap jaw from the uh, Masters of the Universe. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Just growing up as a child of the 80s. Uh, the music was terrible, but the <laughs> cartoons were amazing. I thought the music... Wait. I mean, no, I'm, uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> For the most part, it was. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, it was like, it was one of those things that... Um, Beautiful. Just, you know, I played in my room with action figures. I, right. you know, those were, a lot of times those were my friends <laughs> for Anything being true. locked in your room, you know what I mean? And you're kind of right like, well, not like my parents locked me in my room, but, but <laughs> being in your room and wanting to explore new worlds and, yes. and stuff, it was kind of cool to have these characters to watch on TV right. and then to you imagine uh, a role play of what they're doing, of new course. little things. So it's kind of cool to like, I wanted to take a character that was classic, somebody that I, I absolutely loved and try to add like a little twist to it. And when I was looking up references, I feel like these were 
all over the board, mm. um, but I wanted different elements to bring into it so it wasn't like I love the I love the cartoon and I love sure. the action figure, but I wanted to make it like this is this added some just beef to it, some heavy realism. Yeah. yeah, it takes it out of the cartoon world, Very if you will, so. and brings it into uh, a contemporary hardcore uh, uh, film like mm -hmm. presentation, which is wonderful. Um, and you guys, this is a message to you out there. You know, you can do a sculpture of like the Easter Bunny, for example, and reimagine your stuff. This is a great example of a cartoon character. It lives in this space. Mm -hmm. It lives in my memory and in my childhood fondly. Uh, and what Kevin did this week is through his work ethic and through his workflow and through thoughtful uh, drawing, he plotted to go ahead and bring this character into a realistic bent. And of course, we're so happy for this. Now. It was kind of fun because it was sort of like a, it was sort of like the last minute driving in here. Right. Uh, I kind of was like, what if I sort of merged Skeletor with Trapjaw and sort of made a right. skeletal Trapjaw? And I thought that right. that was kind of, right. I mean, that those references kind of pulled at that already anyway. Right. And I thought maybe taking him right. less human and more orc, but yeah. I like yeah. the idea of adding the skull because it gives right. also to another, you have a hard texture. Right. Then you have the bony texture. Right. Um, and then you have more of a metallic jaw. So I wanted to give something that would also not just be one character with That's one. Right. That's right. I wanted to learn from you right. so I can take ideas to my to my right. house and my studio right. and be able to create things and learn different techniques and different textures right. and everything right. like that. And I feel well, this is wonderful. Let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, we have a term in here, and you hear, you hear it when you're in the business of somebody who has perhaps overworked a sculpture. This is a danger. You take a, a design element or a detail element that you fall in love with, and because you want to impress everybody and you want to deliver a great sculpture, you kind of kill it with one value. What he's talking about is different topography happening here. You have the smoothness, and he and I have already talked about it. He's going to come back on with baby powder, and he's going to buff this thing into a high shine finish. But look right next to it is bone. and sculptural things that are referenced from bone. You also have things that are very designy. That, by the way, can we talk about this for a second? Oh yeah. You brought in this great reference to find some of this stuff. These type of elements are pure your imagination. Imagine that this is a beautiful sentence. Look at this punctuation, as well as here. And certainly in here, look at that form right in there. This is the thing that I didn't expect. I knew something special was gonna happen with you because you have incredible amount of experience. When I say punctuation of the sentence, I mean this form is augmented by the little, the little details. A lot of it he found here. I want you to talk about your friend that makes these. Yeah, there's a, um, an amazing shop called The Skull Shop and uh, he just it makes tons of different replicas of different right. skulls and uh, I've had several of them over the years um, right. from him and I just I feel like that's such an amazing true to like without having a human skull it's sure. a true form of having a good reference point and right. you know there's a lot of times where if I'm doing something at home or if I'm drawing for a client for a tattoo I can take and light that in different ways and I can that's get right. different you know depths and everything in it yeah. but using it for this it was really nice to have a side by side because there were certain elements that he had done Right. that I was able to pull from, but right. then at the same time, for me, as if I was designing like a, a, a kind of a creature-y skull, right. um, there's other elements that I would add in anyway sure. to make sure. it a little bit less human, but still keeping it humanized, but adding a little more little textures, little details. Right. That's where that little stuff will come in or whatever. I so I it. thought it was kind of something, it. this is fantasy anyway. I didn't right. want to necessarily have a replica of a skull inside of that, I think. Right. It's not boring. I would be super true to reality, but sure. I wanted to make him, bring him into reality right. with still a bit of fantasy. Of course. Too. And you know what? It's funny because I used to get accused, and I could still be accused of uh, consulting what we would call bullshit anatomy. There's a time and a place to go ahead and take your, what's in your own inclination and comes out of your style and your love of form. However, to jump off for our young sculptors out there, to be able to jump off and reference uh, a, a real skull or aquatic life mm -hmm. or trees. We were talking about fractal stuff during our class. 
Uh, there's all kinds of realistic stuff in nature that can be found and brought into your artwork that will give it uh, a little incredible punch. Uh, there's never, I don't think there's also too, in any form of art, mm -hmm. um, I guess the word copying is always looked down upon, Right. but I think the word referencing is more of a sure. more of an accurate tool for that. It's like I think, feel like, you know, I don't want to copy right. the skull and pull it in there, but I want to reference the points because, yeah, you might be a phenomenal artist. You might be right. able to draw, you know, something amazing or whatever, but why not reference it rather than sit and make mistakes and spend hours trying to correct and correct and correct if you're using an actual realistic tool and you're drawing from that right. for inspiration and as reference i feel like it's gonna it's gonna help you in so Absolutely. many different ways because you might not know like the cheekbone the yeah. cheekbone's wrong compared to that but to him it's not wrong right right you know so there's things that you want to develop along the way i feel right and once again even simple simple things even if it isn't a major design element you see this kick right here? You see how that's pronounced? He used a bit of that to inform him in this area. Of course, he took it off into something that would be more dramatic. But once again, any kind of assistance. You know, guys, sometimes I'll just do a drawing. I mean, like a stick figure. Sometimes to just come on out of darkness and just go for a sculpture is very difficult. So to do a little drawing, even though it's not absolutely necessary, to have some toys that are on the subject matter, some skulls, and certainly some drawings that come from you. It gives you a little bit of relaxation yeah. when you jump into something like this. Now, I just want to point out this, this something that just kicks me on this and why I'm so happy to share this is he's got some great victories in here. Just hang out and look at that profile. You see that this jaw is made of metal. It's heavy metal. We've got history. We've got pocking. We also have a connection to what is the ear aspect that ties into the jaw and kind of ties the sculpture together. But this is what gets me. We've got this kind of retro bitchin' helmet. We've got this wicked skull, which reminds me of uh, just, I don't know, just intense kind of fright skull. And then we've got this heavy, thick jaw. But look at the dynamic nature of the profile. I want you to know that Kevin worked with the profile first, mm -hmm. first. And when you see his drawing, which I've already put away, yeah. Uh, he did a profile take on it, and contemplating this, and then jumping off with your sculpture here in the profile first, that gives you a leg up. He already had this established when the, within the first two days. So once again, when doing this kind of character, when doing any kind of character, if it has a pronounced snout, if it's an animal, for example, or if it has a pronounced jaw, you want to start with the profile, and this is a note out there to you beginning sculptors. By establishing this in a drawing, and then by establishing it in the sculpture early on, he was able to go ahead and get the design easily. Imagine if he started just at the front of the face. Mm -hmm. You can't gauge the depth. You can't really get a sense of it. But once again, on day two, you already had this sketched in. Yeah. And it was very evocative of the drawing. And the drawing was with him till about day three, and then you know what? Drawing falls away. And he's on to this. I'm going to turn it back, and then I want to ask you some questions that I think folks out there in our audience want to want to know. And uh, well, I love this. Uh, sculpting is filled with challenges and filled with wonderful rewards. I want to I want to first talk about something that was hard. Okay. Uh, what was something that was difficult for you in this sculpture? Um, I feel like. Well, there are a lot of things I feel, you know, were difficult. It's obviously coming at it sort of your first time, you're in your head, you're like, ah, I can, like, I can take this head on. But when you, I think when you start to put the clay on, it's weird because I feel like I, the drawing was probably maybe like 20, 30 minutes or whatever, just to kind of get a reference idea together. Right. But once I started realizing it, I feel like, I feel like, bringing it from drawing to the first stage of it. Sure, the block out. Yeah, I would say that is actually almost the most difficult thing because mm -hmm. you have a lot of patience in art, and I think that's what makes a good artist a good artist is if right. you have the patience to actually let something develop sure. instead of just getting antsy and jumping in. Right. I'm also an antsy person in other ways, but I feel like that was probably the hardest thing for me Jumping, was, jumping. Was even like the first day, and I'm like, right. ugh, yeah. I'm like, I want it, you know? And right. it's like, you're so far from it. Right. And then the second day, you're just like, come on, like, yeah. I want to get to that part. And then 
the third, you know, by the end of the second day and into the third day, all of a sudden all these forms start taking place and he right. starts coming to life That's right. from the drawing to that. So I feel like that was maybe the hardest part for me was right to on. sort of right bring it from nothing to something. Right. But as far as technique wise and learning that stuff, I would say probably the most difficult thing was learning how to how to cut in things. I, I, I would think of like before this week, I would think of sculptures as here's a block. Right. I'm taking away from the, I'm sculpting away from it. And yeah, it's I all know. about removal. It's right. not really about adding. And I feel like there was a few things that you were showing me right. on, especially to like the gum or the gum ish line or whatever right. for around the tooth, yeah. how to pronounce that tooth out. Right. It was weird that you started right in and you started chiseling away the tooth and right. I was like whoa wait wait yeah yeah you know yeah. and then I then I was like oh wait a second it's already there you're yeah. sort of taking away from it That's right. so there are those elements that you know you can add those little pieces on and, right. and blend stuff in to kind of build up right. around the tooth and stuff but it was just interesting to see that and right. initially I would have thought you make a tooth right. you make a cavity you fill the cavity so it's well, you bring up something that's so wonderful the reason why I love this type of clay the reason why I love this kind of sculpture. Um, you folks out there have heard me talk about this before. Uh, Don, do you want to sculpt marble? No. I love addition and subtraction, and you and I talked about this. Um, the fact that you're cutting, like the old story was that there's an elephant in this block of clay. Mm -hmm. And you and I talked about this, and you're gonna release or liberate the elephant by removing. Well, that's not true either. That, in essence, is a kind of a nice story to hear, but uh, I love that we sculpt something we do it once, we do it twice, we do it three times, and somewhere in there, hopefully, you did a nose that you don't want to lose. Or you did a nose that's good, but you need to add this. Mm -hmm. You need to subtract this. So really, this form of sculpture, folks, for uh, film and television, amusement parks, toys, what you're involved with is you're in the world of addition and subtraction. That's a luxury. That's something to chase. Mm -hmm. That's something to desire. I have no problem telling you that my first run at what would be this cheekbone, or your first run at it, is pretty good. Is it done in the first wave? No. The second one's going to be better, the third one's going to be it, and maybe the third or fourth, you're going to say, I like it so much, I don't want to change it. And that's when you move on to either an adjacent thing, or you change your perspective and come back out to the overall. Check in with yourself, stand up, get away from the sculpture, look back and say, what's happening to me here? What's happening to the overall? I want you to talk a little bit about shadows. And before you do, uh, he, once again, you know he has a lot of experience and some of his workflow, I was interested to see as an experienced artist, what would come in here. And he really caught the shadows. One of the things that's working so well about this piece are these dark pools of shadow here, here, here. Now let me, let me have you talk about that. That was actually, the funny part about that is that's probably one of my favorite parts of the, of the class is actually learning the shadows and learning the light and how you can tell how something balances out. Like I would have, I guess you're thinking about like a lot of stuff beforehand and what, how you would approach it before you come into a class like this. And I would have approached it by like looking up top looking from side to side, maybe taking a photo and right. setting it out. But it was so interesting the way you had really pointed out what, how dynamic and how important the shadows were, right. not only on the dynamic of the, maybe the aggression in the piece or the, right. um, the dynamics of things, but I right. feel like it's, it's super important because it actually helps you in symmetry. Of course it does, and yes, yes. If you're, you're able to see the it, form. Yeah, because I mean, not everything in nature, nothing is symmetrical at all. But um, yeah. you have a, uh, you know, when you're, I feel like when you're sculpting stuff, you want to have it as true to form. Right. You don't want a cheekbone up here and one down here unless yeah, you're yeah, making yeah, something yeah. that half of it's, you know, sure. wonky or whatever. But I feel like if you're doing something, it was something like this where I was trying to balance stuff out. Right, right. Um, I can, I feel a lot of things out with my hands and feel like sure. where the contours of certain, okay, this is a little right. higher, this is a little lower, I can build it up. Right. But I feel like those shadows were probably the most important thing into balancing right. the structure of it because I feel like I could sit back That's and right. the way that the lighting was yeah. hitting it, yeah. I would see that, that this, um, this cheekbone is, is adding a little bit more shadow here than it is here. So I want to actually either 
cut away a little bit here or I want to add a little bit here to actually balance those shadows out. So Perfect. I feel like that was that was probably one of the most important things that you had showed me. Let me add so. something to that because it's so important. Um, well, Dick Smith, one of the great sculptors, the, the dean of special effects makeup, uh, Dick Smith always had you have one key light that was right here. And it's through having that one dominant light that we're able to look at different forms and evaluate them. The light is really helping us trap uneven things, as well as the sword and as well as other things, measurements, certainly calipers and what have you. But once again, uh, well, that one dominant light. I want to tell a quick story. I was working at Patrick Totopolis's and I was working on an underworld or something, and I'm trying to sculpt a kneecap. And I keep going in circles and it's not happening and I'm getting emotional and there's people you know, looking at me doing this thing and I'm self-conscious and it just keeps crashing and crashing. And so I look and Totopolis has got uh, big windows that travel the length of the shelf. So I've got my dominant light coming from these fluorescents and then I've got a wash of daylight coming in. No wonder the poor soul can't figure out a kneecap. Yeah. I've got too many sources of light attacking the sculpture. So I'm gonna turn on the shop lights for a second. I want you guys to see this. Most of what he did here, I'm in love with this dramatic lighting because it's capitalizing on the shadows that he worked for. Let me bring up the shop light for a second. It's funny that at work everyone makes fun of me because I don't use light. I, right. use, the, I use the natural light. So right, right, for right. me, I like the room to be filled with a lot of light. Right. So it's fun to take on a different form of, right. of art and then to actually realize that in something like this, you need to strip away everything and then go back to one to light. <laughs> to evaluate form, to evaluate form. It's best. Now, certainly there's a time to play with the light. We just turned back on the shelf lights here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you still get the dynamics, though. Even with some of the stuff, you, you still do. get yeah. the dynamics and the right. rim of the helmet underneath right. the eyes and everything, too. So Now, you know, listen, uh, once again, with your experience in artwork, what was something that was easy? What was something that came together really easy for you? Wow, that's actually a, that's that's a, that's a really tough easy. one. Yeah, nothing came that's easy, okay. which I feel is cool I, because I like to be challenged in that sense, but I feel like... Let me change it this way. Did you have a tool experience? Oh, or, my God. We do a lot of explanation of tools here. Did you catch on to something that you liked? Absolutely. And, and we'll talk about that. It, you know, um, okay, here's something I, got, I guess I could actually relate to my current business or whatever, but um, in tattooing... There's a lot of stuff where you, you have tools as well, right. and you use your um, you use your different like your needle groupings. You use them in different ways, and you sure. and over your experience and over the years, right. you get a way to like for example, you're you're using instead of using this as a flat piece, you know you're using the corner. So it's that, like it's there it the is. same thing. Yeah. That that is in this realm of of art uh, and sculpting. I like how there were certain ways that I gravitated towards, uh, I would say specifically these two tools. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I loved the way in the ends, you know, you can get in and pick out the little detail stuff or whatever, but doing some like broad subtraction, right. but also like being able to almost use that, like there was little points where I'd use it as a finger. Right. And I would kind of push things in. Right. And this, you guys, is the Kemper D9. And I love that you caught on to that. I love, this is probably my go-to tool, and yeah. this one, you introduced this to me, and I don't think I can ever live without this tool. <laughs> the clay well, I, I love couldn't. it. I it's, couldn't. It's such a cool thing, because there's times where I use it as a paintbrush, there's times that right. I use it to, right. um, like, I'll balance right. something, and I'll use that as a straight edge. That's right. That's you know, right. to kind of cut a corner or something. Right. So there were a lot of things that I really liked about Wonderful. these tools. And once again, just to drive that point home, you said it beautifully. Every time... Uh, we talked about this at length. Uh, every time he changes the, the, how he holds the tool, he can get a different effect. So this way, uh, he gets a different value. This way is totally a different value, a sharper line. This way, and dragging that way, you get a very fine line. You roll over, you have a burnishing tool. You also have a limiter. You cannot do a hard, deep cut line with that. What you can do is you can do shadows, uh, beautiful little shadows like the depth around an eye, for example. I can approach that with that. You can see that the tool is actually the shape that I'm trying to emulate, if you follow that. But anyways, any way that you change it, these wonderful tools, the more you speak the language of clay, the more you can do with these tools. This tool, the clay shaper, we don't talk a lot about this, 
it's kind of an intense learning curve, mm -hmm. if you agree. Yeah. Um, but once you get this, this kind of tool is fantastic for eyelids, the edges of the ear. You can almost machine stuff with this. And of course, the magic for this, in, in my opinion, is uh, the soft, round shapes. Circles within circles, pillows within pillows, if you will, of lips. If you look at Jim Henson's work and a lot of that stuff. Uh, well, I want you out there to try the rubber tip yeah, tool. I, I, yeah. I, this is my first time sculpting, really, and I would, I would suggest yeah. trying that. Right, right. I like, I like also too that, like, just to talk about these for a second. Sure, like, sure. I like the idea of being able to use this in so many different ways, but also right. there's a certain, um, maybe not joy might not be the word, but there's a certain element of displacement of the clay yes, with that, this. Okay. So using this as opposed to like as opposed to removing right um it's interesting because there was times where i'd almost like a painter right. almost right. instead of like holding all my stuff and painting right. and then switching between brushes right. there was times where i'm like oh you know what i want to pull a little bit away here right. and then i'll be like oh you know what i want to smooth a little bit here but That's i want to also get yep. in there and get a nice little edge and That's figure right. out ways to different use these in different well, ways the, you so. hit it right on the head this is a subtraction tool mm -hmm. this is a refinement tool of line mm -hmm. uh, wonderful when, it, when I first got in the business, everybody would cut a line, then trench it. Not anymore. The rubber tip tool cuts the line and softens it, burnishes it, and gets rid of the artifact for you in one step. So it actually replaced three steps and put it in this tool. Well, needless to say, the tools are our toys. Yeah. It's our joy. As we move through different uh, sculptures and as we get more experience, I myself, and I want you to look for this on your path, you go through honeymoon phases. I love this tool. This is the greatest tool in the world. Some months go by, you get on another show, and then you find another, I love, this is the tool, and yeah. then you forget this one. Anyways, old soldiers, I got a box of them. Anyways, well, this is wonderful. I want to talk a little bit also about um, what you might do from here. Uh, you guys out there, if you know me, you know I'm, uh, many people that take my class, they uh, fall in love with the sculpture, which is our dream, that's our wish, and uh, I think you're gonna mold this. Oh, for sure. And uh, I want you to talk about a paint, paint potential um, would you stay with the original uh, colors? I, I would imagine you'd probably do one that was probably true. If you did do another, once again, your skill is amazing with painting. I imagine that you could do something else. Would there be a variant? Yeah, well, uh, I think I would take it more of a darker. I mean, I, I, there would be an element of taking it traditionally, but right. I'm kind of an earth tone guy. Okay. I guess you probably can guess <laughs> that. But, uh, okay. Um, I would probably take him and make him more maybe darker. Like yeah, I would. Darker? I would say maybe using like even a even a mix between the two and using like like here, you know, you're, there's like more um, I guess more plums and magentas sure, and sure. burgundies and stuff like that, and this right. sense or whatever. And here, it's more of like these poppy, gotcha, you know, like gotcha. popping stuff. But right. I love like. I love, I would probably take and use some sort of greenish, right. uh, like maybe even an olive or an avocado or something like that right. in here, mixed with bones. So there would Beautiful. be elements, it would be a different coloring in certain elements, you know, obviously okay. darker to keep like the cavities darker and pop them out. But love it. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't do too much um, decaying or whatever within right. the skull because I'd want to keep it less. Um, like less mossy kind of grown on it, you know right. what I mean? Less of that sort of thing, more of it like, like bone, just like stripped down. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'd let, I'd rather have like, uh, the these other elements right. sort of set him within them. So right. this, and then again, and having the contrast between the three pieces, right. I'd like this one. I want to be more. If you leave a just a giant chunk of metal or something yeah. outside, <laughs> right. and it's beaten up and it's been through the ringer of everything, right? But it still maybe have some. Like there's a little bit of stuff I kind of wanted, like an erosion of almost like an acidic, like stressed metal. Yeah, yeah. something. Yeah. You know, you mean you have your, you have your. It, he's been through shit. You know, sure he uh, He's been through stuff. So yeah. it's like history. It's, history. Yeah, he, you know. So it's he's he, there's power to him. Right. Um. And I wanted. I mean, he was he was like the right hand man to Skeletor. You know, he's right. got to be like right. Skeletor was weak. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you yeah, know, yeah, you got to yeah. have like yeah. Crap Trail's got to be coming and like. Yeah handle it you know what I mean so I feel like that character in this like in the coloring too I feel like you can make it very playful right um, and that could be a variant in the future or whatever but um, I feel like he needs to be 
he, his coloring needs to be as strong as right. he is, you know. And he's definitely been pulled into reality. For sure. I feel like this character was a cartoon. That cartoon may have been based on this. In other words, this is the being. This yeah. is a living thing, and the cartoon was an accounting of it. I guess initially I wanted to create sound pretentious, the, <laughs> I wanted to create something that I would love to have. Like I want to create a toy that I would own, like exactly. something that I could go buy, yeah. Yeah. but like something that you could create. And I feel like this character is so cool and so under appreciated I think in the whole Masters of the Universe realm or whatever and uh, I feel like he I want to make something that I can put I mean I'm going to put yeah, so many yeah. more hours besides this course into this Beautiful. thing to make it just like a beast you well, know and we're, and we're anxious to, for you to, to post it you know at the end of the 40 hour uh, time here um, the sculpture is done when he says it's done it's not done when I say it's done he's going to continue this meditation he's going to continue and finish the sculpture He's going to mold it, and then he's going to do paint variations, and he's going to post those. Yes, absolutely. And I'm pretty excited about that. And, of course, after a class like this, I'm very selfish. I always want to see what you do next. That's cool. And so we're, I'm already looking for I have, like, a million things in my head already that yeah. I want to do anyway, so. Well, awesome, man. And, uh, well, once again, it's been a pleasure working with you. And any time that we can uh, see something that's in the culture, in the pop culture, and pull it, and pull it into reality, uh, it's just a wonderful thing to do. Um, I have to ask you, just because I have you here, do you feel that, that being uh, uh, in the world of tattoos, uh, do you feel that it helped your workflow here? Were you a little more clear-minded? Uh, I know there's always a little anxiety in me when I sculpt. Yeah. Do you feel like anything was unlocked by being an, an artist already for many years? Um, I feel like there were a lot of things that carried over. Um, mm -hmm. I guess just with anything, I mean, I've basically grew up as an illustrator so right. to me that was like getting that foundation into it but there's like there's little things that I feel yeah I feel that carry over right. and um and a lot of that has to do with just shape and form I right. feel like I right. do a lot of in tattooing I do a lot of um I prefer realism stuff and right. a lot of black and gray so it's interesting to actually work in a very monochromatic feel too right so I'm kind of I am working in black and gray before I go to paint it, as I opposed see. to me doing like right. a Star Wars character or something on, right. a, on right. a tattoo or whatever. But I like that way because I see, not that I'm colorblind, but I see that way most of the time in, right. my, in my tattoos because that's what I gravitate I more see. towards. So for me, it was actually really cool to kind of utilize the illustration side of it and the shadows and to, right. to the way to draw something right. Right. I almost was drawing it more the form in here to get those shadows to make things a little bit more dynamic and I feel right. like that's even where some of the little mistakes sort of turn into cool cool elements elements yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 well I'm with you well that's awesome well once again uh, our community is wonderful you guys are great at supporting us out there Thank I you want you to, I want you to follow Kevin and I want you to look for his future sculptures I got a feeling something very special is going to happen for this artist and something special is happening for him all the time. Can you tell us about your work and where you're working now? What's happening? Uh, um, yeah. Well, just a little bit. Um, for, I've been out in Los Angeles for about eight and a half years now yeah. and uh, I work at um, High Voltage Tattoo in awesome. Los Angeles in Hollywood right. and uh, love it. Um, surrounded yeah. by amazing artists all the time. Um, Kat handpicks right. everybody so Perfect. everybody that we work with is it's a joy because everybody's so like I look at the next guy's work right. and I'm just like it challenges you to a higher level and you just keep That's pushing right. each other so yeah. Yeah. that um, in that form I love the tattoo industry because I love being right. surrounded right. by creative like creativity all the time it pushes you on and it Absolutely. keeps your education going yep there's always I notice this with myself I've worked very hard and there's always an artist that's better than me there's always somebody who's got something more interesting and those are the people that I learn from mm -hmm. and uh, oh, that makes it juicy it makes our whole community dynamic and we're all pushing against each other mm -hmm. if we can transcend in my case our own competition which I suffered from in the first couple of years of working uh, then you have a better experience remember that uh, but anyways I want you to check out Kevin's uh, tattoo work uh, and uh, that's a whole other uh, <laughs> panel and depth to this gentleman and once again, I had a great yeah. time. Thank you so much for everything. It's my great pleasure to have you here. Thank you guys yeah. for being a part of this with us as well. Right on, right on. Well, they're very supportive. Um, everybody, thank you for looking in and, and sharing your Easter, just a few moments of your Easter with us. Of course, I want to thank Kevin. 
uh, he came in here uh, on Monday and absolutely didn't get up once. Just yeah. the whole time. <laughs> Actually, yeah. There were some juices brought in, some drinks, but he yeah. didn't leave the table. And I appreciate that work ethic. It got me stirred up and uh, I appreciate that, uh, that strength. Uh, I want to also thank Berman Industries for our clay. Thank you everybody over there. I've been shopping at Berman Industries since I was 16 years old. And when you buy materials, they're gonna give you information that's gonna help you create your dreams into reality. Uh, Nigel's, thank you for our head forms and all of our support. And most importantly, thank you for being open on the weekend. Eli Elliot Brodsky, I wanna mention my friend Elliot Brodsky. We just wrapped up Monster Palooza out here in Los Angeles and Elliot gave my students and my company a table in their Monster Palooza Museum. Thank you so much. What a positive affirmation for our young artists to come on, do a sculpture, and then be able to show it to 10,000 people at one of the greatest trade shows, one of the only trade shows that I hit. Love Neil Gordon and the prosthetic show as well. That's my second. Uh, but our Monster Palooza show out here is wonderful and something to see in April. And thank you, Elliot, for favoring us with a table. I'm going to be in France at the ACT Academy, Ecole du... Maquillage. Say that for me. Say it. <laughs> I don't know. Ecole du Maquillage. Yeah, you have to say it with flair. Forgive me. I didn't want to murder that, uh, Richard. <laughs> My friend there is Richard Masson. And this comes to us via... Um, I know. It's just dreadful. This comes to us via, via Neil Gorton, my dear friend. Uh, Neil, I've had a lot of people ask me if I'm coming back out. I'm sending him your way. Uh, Neil Gorton has set up this where I, I met a wonderful man named Richard Masson at the ACT Academy, and I will be in Lille, France in September. Uh, if you're out there, I want you to come shake my hand. I don't care if you're taking the class. We've got a beautiful class planned for you. Take the class. But I want you to, <laughs> I want you to uh, come out and see me there. I'm so thankful to travel and see that part of the world. Uh, had France on my mind quite a bit, as did all of us. I have a new class coming May 20th through 24th. Seating is always limited. Uh, I want you to call and find out some information. If it's comfortable for you, if it's a good time in your life to do it, I want you to come join us for a class. Thank you so much. Our Facebook family out there, I know that you're looking in on this, and Facebook and Instagram has been a wonderful support for our um, for our efforts, efforts here to train the next generation. And uh, we're so thankful for you. And uh, once again, follow this fine gentleman, uh, Gabby Lanning. Thank you for filming everything. We love you. And happy Easter to all of you in your homes. Take care. We'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>